Good afternoon. Thank you, everybody, for uh, coming to join us today. I know it's starting to become another part of the long day as we get excited in the morning, get fed, and then start uh, thinking as all these incredible presentations happen throughout the day. So really appreciate uh, you coming to our session and, uh, and hearing about our Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health that it, we're proposing to UBC. But before we get started any further, what I'd like to do is introduce someone that has been absolutely integral to the proposal and a guiding light for our team at UBC, uh, Chief Wayne Christian. And he's gonna come up and do an opening prayer for us and then we'll get started. Thank you. I'm Chief Wayne Christian, and I've been asked to uh, which is pray in our language to open this session, and uh, uh, I've just been learning my language and you know, the residential school and all that stuff, and I was involved in the 60s group. Uh, so I'm just actually learning to uh, speak uh, so I'd like to uh, offer this prayer for the work that uh, you're all going to be doing here. Uh, not only here, but uh, throughout all the, uh, the meeting rooms that are happening. And, uh, and after I do that, I have to leave because next door they're talking about the social determinants of health, and uh, it really is of interest to me. So I just want to uh, begin with the prayer. So. Well, Kukbi, Katma Kosma Kakatin, Kokstako, Tal Kukbi, Kokstako Tamisku, you come into Hawaii, Testament Elliot Tamik, you come into Rakhkalmuk. Spuria, Asarka, El Rachitlinku, Kanukunku, Yoyat Ku, Koksako Tel Kukbi, Hoquietus Dem, Hoquietus Renkasalt, and all my relations. So thank you very much, Koksha. All right, so if we can have the presentation up. I, what I plan to do this afternoon is give you just a brief overview of what's been uh, a lot of work over the last couple of years with a wide multidisciplinary group of people who have been interested in actually helping UBC develop a Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that means, what our main focus is gonna be, but really, as we're going through this, I encourage you to jot down some questions, some comments, some ideas, because we're hoping that we're going to have some time here to really get your input. Because this is a proposal. In fact, we have a date that we will be presenting this at UBC to the Senate on November 20th, at which point the, we will know whether we're going forward with this further. I also, this is a process at a university. I think it's important that you know that it's already gone through the policy committee and was passed unanimously. I think it's important for you to know that we have had uh, tremendous support from the administration of UBC who have acknowledged uh, the need for this. Uh, and that one of our team, member, team members sends his regrets that he could not make it and that's uh, Dr. Link Kessler who's been involved with the First Nations House of Learning as the leader there and is the special advisor to the president on Indigenous Affairs at UBC. So we've really, uh, although it's up, me up here speaking, I cannot stress enough the amount of uh, input that has gone into this and the huge team that we have that have put a lot of uh, heart and soul into the project. So, let's see here. Next slide, please. There we go. So basically, UBC Center for Excellence is located in, in the multi, it's for, across the health disciplines. So at first, we thought what we were gonna do is create this center, this idea for the Faculty of Medicine, which is the largest faculty at UBC and certainly encompasses a lot of the health disciplines. As an indication of the support, what happened was it was recognized that there are a lot of health disciplines that are not in the Faculty of Medicine. 
We started to get into the details about how a university as large as UBC is and, and how it is organized, but it became evident that the benefit of this uh, centre could be reached to all the other health disciplines that aren't in the faculty, including things like nursing or dentistry or pharmacy, and, and the list goes on. There are three critical areas where we are focusing. Sometimes we call them pillars, but this is sort of how we wrap our head around it when we're looking at ways to organize things and focus. One is research, one is curriculum or education, we call it, and the other is students. But overwhelmingly, the importance of this is really the partnerships between uh, the, the faculties and the students and the professors and the administration of the university. But much more importantly, of course, is who this is for, and so partnerships with communities and community organizations. So when we're looking at the concept of research, for the most part, we, could, we have handouts to give you for all these slides. We really, with the time, limited time that we have, I'm not going to go through each of these points, except to make sure that you encourage you to take home one of these uh, handouts that have these slides verbatim, and then you can go through it. But to give you some of the highlights, Research is such an important part of how we are going to move forward with either we've heard about it a lot with the First Nations Health Authority, but certainly with our health concerns. And it's important that the research be driven by communities with their priorities, with their ideas. And what our center is hoping to do is simply be that unifying place where if questions arise and a community wants to undergo research and they need some assistance or want to partner, that we can be that focal point at the university where they can contact and we can hook you up with people who have similar interests, perhaps expertise or experience in an area, and partnerships can be formulated when research projects arise at the community level. And that's a really key point. Um, overall, the, uh, the other thing is basically collaboration within the university is important because what we found and what community members have repetitively said when we've asked them is that it's sometimes frustrating because there's all these different projects going around and sometimes they're very similar and there's, it, it seems like why can't researchers get their act together and actually not keep coming to our communities when someone just asked us about this concept of a diabetic research study or suicide or cancer or, or issue X, Y, or Z. So how do we create that level of collaboration within the university? I think it's important that we, the one thing that we want to avoid certainly in, in research is that concept of what we used to call parachuting. And communities have said that, you know, that they feel that researchers come in and they parachute into a community and then they leave and don't ever return the results. This is going to be a place where we can make sure that that is a fundamental thing that we address because of the partnerships. Education or curriculum is certainly being uh, at the university a key point. Uh, a lot of the issues with respect to what's going to be involved have been brought up already and brought up as major concerns by the First Nations Health Authority themselves, and that's stuff like cultural safety, cultural competency. It's involving uh, curriculum development that's currently going on in a very active way at the Faculty of Medicine, but universities are a dynamic field and essentially as soon as a curriculum is developed, there's always room for change, room for improvement, and hopefully this centre will not only be a focal point where we can get input in from the Indigenous perspective, but also a point where people can come when they have concerns about curriculum or ideas about how to improve it, and we can help facilitate that with the people who are experts uh, in that area, community members that come in with these ideas. Oh, sorry about that. And the other one is students. And really, in, in a way, we should almost reverse the slide order to be students and then education and curriculum and research. Because our first, and prior, first priority that we're really focusing on um, in terms of identifying gaps at UBC is really facilitating uh, what's happened to a degree of success at the Faculty of Medicine, but making sure that we expand on that and improve it in other areas of the university. We have uh, James Andrew here, who's been a big part of uh, running the Aboriginal Admissions Program for the Faculty of Medicine, and we know the success that that has had and the impact that has had, but at the same time, we know that that needs to be done across the disciplines at UBC. 
Students also need support, not only in terms of getting into a program, but also the financial support and the social support that it takes. And so things that we're working on are identifying funding sources for things like scholarships and bursaries so that we can bring more students into the field of the health disciplines because as I mentioned last night and, has it, and how it's been mentioned a few times is really developing the capacity and representation of our people in the health disciplines. And that's another area that we would focus on. The other thing is a support network for students so that if they're interested in pursuing health careers, that we can help them along the spectrum. I think, and our group thinks, and I think overall, this is what we've heard, is that universities have a responsibility to help students get to them, not just help them when they're there. So first of all, it's the admissions programs that we have. It's also the recruitment, seeing potential that's out there and helping guide them into programs that, that, they, that they want to get into. It's also what we call retention, but really it's the support so that they stay there, they're successful, that they're happy there in a culturally competent environment that provides them the resources and what they need to succeed in whatever path they choose. And there are little bits of it at UBC, but this is one of our main focuses in terms of improving that. The partnerships, as I said, is the unifying theme of this entire center. And so if, if there's one thing that we could ask is please take the, your handout so that you have our contact information. Any ideas you have, any concerns, any suggestions, feel free to contact us. There's a website at UBC where you can get a full, you can see the full proposal that we present, that we'll send out to Senate, but also at the same time, we have also done our best to engage in as many people as we can, whether it's within the university as an internal partnership, whether it's between the faculties, whether it's outside the university, whether it's academic people, or whether it's organizations and communities. And, um, and that's what we're really trying to do. And focusing on the fact that, yes, the proposal is being put forward to Senate, but it's a draft proposal. And Senate might get a little bit upset about that. And the way I describe that is, it's not a draft proposal. It'll be final as of November 6th, when the due date is to send it into Senate. But on November 7th, if an idea comes up, the university will not stop us from improving and making this center fit what the communities want. And I think that with the leadership that we have at the center, uh, if there's one thing I can assure you is that we we're very, very comfortable with making sure that the university understands the importance that this center is going to be not static, but something that grows and improves with suggestions and input from people like you who are taking an afternoon to, to share your thoughts. So again, the Center for Excellence, these are the goals. I hope by now that just hearing about the pillars of the center and what it's about and the process it's going through, that these goals are not going to be surprising in terms of improving wellness and moving down those lines. We want your thoughts. We want your ideas. We don't expect them all to be positive, all to be um, suggestions for change. Whatever it is, we want to make sure that you feel comfortable communicating with us so that we can make this a center that's going to be successful. The only way it can be successful is that if it answers to the people that we're hoping to touch. Thank you. So now, uh, what I'd like to do is we have, let's see, it's crazy. Can you believe we only have 19 minutes left? So first of all, is there anyone here that's going to leave without the handout? Anyone? Awesome. Okay. Mission accomplished. So the next thing is, I thought we, what we could do is take, yeah? Oh, yeah, we'll, we'll pass them out. We'll make sure that they're there for you on your way out. And we have them, right? Yeah, good. Thank goodness, after all that. <laughs> Trust me, the kind of day I'm having, sometimes I wonder. I thought what we could do is focus on one pillar, for lack of a better term right now, 
why don't we focus on one thing? And if there's any suggestions, questions, the entire team that's been sort of the, the core group here uh, is here. Uh, unfortunately, Chief Wayne Christian had to step out. Dr. Kessler is away. Louise Naismith has, has been a, a guiding force, and the administration from UBC is not here. But I think that we have a, a significant core group of us here that if there's any questions, um, ideas, thoughts, um, please feel free to voice them. And I thought what we'd start off first with is students, knowing that what we'd been talking about is even the First Nations Health Authority, talking about increasing the representation of Aboriginal people in the healthcare professions. What can this center do to help students do that? Any thoughts? Right there. Okay. Kids have a perception of, you know, getting into the health field is doctors and nurses. Yeah. And I've been advertising and saying there's more to it than that. I said there's a whole book, and I lost the book, but um, on all the different phases. And, and to me, right now, with all of us going into our different health um, um, agent, little agencies or clinics and that, it's, you know, more important now than ever. So we have to advertise that to the kids. It isn't only this and that. There's a whole array of services. That is an excellent, excellent point, is that healthcare professions are not just doctors and nurses. And that was one of the things that UBC pointed out to us when we at first focused really just on the faculty of medicine. And so absolutely, we have speech and audiology, we have dentistry, we have social work, we have, and then of course, it, it's, there's different types within those. So we, when we're looking at nursing, we're looking at LPNs, RNs, nurse practitioners for our rural communities, which are often the First Nation communities up north. Absolutely, and then working so that they understand that that's, that, um, that there's that range of potential, because quite honestly, um, if you were to say to me that I was going to be a nurse tomorrow on the family medicine ward, I would be lost. You know, I may be a surgeon one floor up on the surgery ward, but I absolutely respect the work that those nurses do. It's a skill set that's different, and it's a team that actually makes that care optimal. So if I can ask you a favor, if you have any resources for us in terms of uh, a contact or something, um, that would be wonderful so that we can make sure that this center has those little out, uh, outreachings to those outside of the university. I think we're doing it well in the university, but outside the university, it would be great. Thank you. Right there, yes. We had a question. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, Dr. Karen, Carol, Carolyn Small Lakes, Treaty 7, Alberta region. I just wanted to share with you that in Alberta, we do what we call a Health Horizon Days, and it's in partnership with the University of Alberta. Our children learn more by ha hands-on learning. So we have implemented Health Horizons, and what we do is we take students from the community, um, high school students, grade seven to 12, we take them to Edmonton, and the University of Alberta walks them through their whole medical di uh, discipline department. There's the nursing, the doctors, the mental health field, and they get to try these hands-on if it's available for them. We found that to be a great success, especially for the K-12 to area. But again, it's focusing from 7 to 12. And that has promoted a lot of people because the kids then go back home to the communities yeah. and say, I want to, you got to see this, you got to try this. So, if, and, and I would, for, I'll forward the information. Thank, thank you. That, I think you've hit on a huge point is that um, you can't, just relying on textbooks and, uh, and the regular teachers in their elementary and high school environment, it's been successful for some, but how do we, uh, attach it to other, you know, other opening their horizons. And that's a great idea. And it's, it's that we are tar hoping that we will have things in place to target even the young, the kindergarten kids, the grade seven kids, the, uh, the high school kids. And I think what you focused on there is to make it fun, to make them realize that learning can be fun and that everything's in their, in their, 
everything's an opportunity for them and giving them that message. Thank you very much. Well, we'll do one more on the, on the student section. There's a question back here or yeah. a comment. Yeah, I'd, I would just like to kind of um, wonder, well, I'm actually wondering how you're connecting the students then back to the community, not so much the students connecting with UBC, because they can go there and they can get the training, but how do they then integrate that into, say, northern communities? Um, because that's pretty far-reaching, and for us, we have a northern university, and we work quite well with them uh, in the remote and rural communities. But if we're looking at doctors coming back into the north, when there's so much competition, how are you addressing those issues? That's, that's great. And, and again, when we say we, there's no way that we could take actually credit for any of this. Uh, it, ourselves because it, what we're trying to do is actually more focus and bring this as a unifying point to get this type of information but how we can help is first of all make sure that that voice is heard but what UBC is doing for example is the northern medical program so the medical school has the main program down in Vancouver but it also has distributed sites and one of them is in Prince George and then the students go up to Prince George and then they have distributed sites for the Northern Medical Program so they go to Terrace or they go to Fort St. John and they, and they go around and so far it's a relatively new program in the scope of medicine because it takes about you know eight to nine years for a specialist at least six years for a family doc once they get into medical school but we're starting to see the data already that shows that if someone comes from a rural program and if they train in uh, in the northern area where they're more exposed to rural medicine and patients coming in from rural areas they're more likely to stay there or go to a comparable community the other thing that I think we can do is actually expose these students more to the type of community, even if they're, even if they, um, what's what's available right now is one month rotations here and there. But to actually increase exposure to Aboriginal health through clinics, such as I see Murray Krause here from the Central Ontario Native Health. You know, there's other centers through many of the places where UBC students are and really working on the curriculum, which is the education section, so a nice leeway into this section is making sure that they have exposure so that they can realize that with going to rural communities and northern communities and Aboriginal First Nation communities is challenge but excitement and a, an incredible opportunity. And the, the physicians that go there, the feedback that they give these students is uh, that th they've gone there by choice, they love it, and they want to stay there. And I think as long as we keep giving those students that exposure and experience, they realize they have an option to do that, and they're not, and they're not, and they're opening up their the sort of net. What used to happen when I went through UBC, you could only go to UBC in Vancouver. I bounced around between St. Paul's Hospital, which is downtown here, Vancouver General Hospital, the largest hospital in Vancouver, and UBC down out on the campus. Those are the only places I was exposed to. There was no northern program to choose from. There was no Aboriginal health rotation, and all of that is being addressed through curriculum. But I think, again, an important point, and we'll certainly be writing that down as another point brought up in this session, so thank you. So we'll switch to education now, just for time purposes. It's, but we sort of touched it on already. Education section of this is really curriculum development. We have Leah Walker here, who has done a tremendous job in that, with some of you have probably been touched in some way or another by the Learning Circle. Who here has seen the, or been in, participated in the Learning Circle? Yeah. And so, and one of the things is that's uh, Leah Walker behind that. And so we, we have some programs in the Faculty of Medicine, but what else can we do? What else would, do you guys see as gaps or ideas um, for education that this center potentially can bring to the proper uh, table or actually do ourselves? Yes. Turn back to our community. Sometimes they're, I guess, you know, exposed to a little bit. No disrespect, but uh, exposed to a little bit of um, lateral violence. It's so notable. 
mm -hmm. you know, the, our own people would not want to go see their own, their own doctor, their own nurse, their own dental therapist. They'd rather see someone else you import. import. And then if they don't like the, the import tea, then they'll come complain some more. So my question is, how would you develop it, the, the mentorship? It really depends on the, on the student's growth as well. You know, when they when they growing up in a, in a reserve or not, you know, you it's your foundation that really builds that strength in you. But if you don't have that foundation, but you have the you have the capacity to go get your prereqs to get into any course, you're fine. But when it comes back to going back to the community, you know, I I learned the hard way not to segregate my people because like be, back then, you know, I'm like, you know, if we're gonna train you, you come back here. Yeah. Now I let go and said, okay, it's the universe. The, the, these guys can go wherever they want. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering how you would put that into the program of mentoring, because I think that's something that's really important for a lot of communities. Yeah, that's a, that's a great point. And we've, we've certainly heard that. Um, mentoring is going to be a significant goal of ours. And I think, again, sort of looking at Leah and James both do that in the Faculty of Medicine already, and uh, James plays a key role in that, even in pre-med students, but certainly in the medical students that are, get in uh, to UBC um, that are Aboriginal. And uh, I think that's important. Part of that is going to be role modeling in terms of the more Aboriginal students that we get into UBC that are incredible right now. They are absolutely humbling individuals to meet. Um, and then the, as we see the success of our people and they branch out into various areas of health care, whether it's doctors and nurses or everything else, I think role modeling is a big role. But I think one of the things we're also doing is making this a focal point so that those students realize that this is a place that they can also play a role of giving back. And so the, I think of role modeling as a very passive thing. So as you succeed, people look and say, aha, if she did it or he did it, then I can do it. Mentoring is very different. Mentoring is very active. It's the person picking up the phone and saying, how are you doing? You know, what, what's going on? What are your challenges? Or the individual feeling comfortable picking up the phone and, and doing that. And I think this, this center is gonna be a place where we are hoping to set up a mentorship program that's very active in that fashion. And then working with the communities, those partnerships. So these communities can pick up the phone, not just for the research idea that they have or the conundrum over an ethics proposal that they're not sure whether they trust, not just, but also for saying, you know what, one of our students is in your program in nursing at UBC, and we're hoping to set up a rotation where they can come back and be a nurse for one of their rotations here in our community. How do we talk to UBC to do that? There's gonna be people at our center that can really uh, work that and understand the process and partner with you to help keep those connections but keep them in a way that fit what the community wants and what the individual wants and I, I think it's a brilliant brilliant point because you do see that it, when people leave their community um, how to keep that connection and keep it an honest one and keep it a comfortable one where both everybody gains yes That's okay. The, uh, the, uh, the medical uh, studies at uh, UBC, are they looking at integrated medicine? Is that the direction that they're going? By integrating medicine, what do you mean? Uh, it's just like I'll take the Chinese people, for instance. Uh, Dr. Richard Hung from, uh, from uh, Edmonton practices integrated medicine where the Chinese medicine and the Western medicine, because he's both, he's Western trained and Chinese trained. And because uh, I find that our medicine is very similar to the Chinese medicine. And uh, so is this the direction that uh, the research is going into integrated medicine? Yeah. That's a great question. And it's actually come up at a couple sessions I've been at so far. Um, and for the most part, what are, that would go into actually into the curriculum, so into the education. And so one of the things that we have put in our proposal is recognizing to have more Aboriginal content within the curriculum, but also have potential for electives 
in traditional medicine, we don't control that curriculum. We would not and we are not asking to have that level of control, but certainly we have people in our group, like Leah Walker sits on the curriculum committee, and um, we, what we would do is be that voice to say, you know, we're talking about increasing the potential for rotations for a student to go to a First Nations community and understand what it's like to do 50% of your healthcare by telemedicine. What a wonderful opportunity as they hop on the helicopter and off they go. We want to make that available, but at the same time, if they want to be uh, working in a different center, in a different context, le learning from a traditional uh, healer, then how do we help to set that up? We don't control the ultimate curriculum, but we can control the fact that experiences should be made available and how important it is to start addressing traditional medicine because it is an issue that came up, yes, last evening in the plenary session. It came up today in the BC Cancer Agency session. And I think that with enough voices, they're going to start hearing it. And if that's what we hear from individuals uh, with the feedback, then our job is not to say what should be done, but to listen to what people need and want and to help facilitate that as a focal point on campus for the Center for Excellence. So we have, we have one minute and 15 seconds. Do we have a research question? Okay, you got your hand up, I can't say no. Sego, hello, my name's Nahani. Um, my uh, question is more of an invitation to talk to you because I think um, the program that I work for kind of touches on all three topics. Um, I also work in the Faculty of Medicine at UBC for a project called Aboriginal E-Mentoring BC. And uh, we work with Aboriginal youth, youth across the province from grades 6 to 12. And we pair them with uh, a university mentor. Um, and the whole focus is to help kids um, not close doors along the way so that when they get to grade 12, they have these opportunities to pursue whatever it is they want. And um, our focus is in health sciences because we all know that we have um, a lack of First Nations professionals in the field. So um, I'd really love to talk to you about the program. Um, I have a booth downstairs. I'm just afraid that you're going to leave and I'll lose you in the crowd. Okay. No. <laughs> so please come find me. We will get contact information before you leave for okay. sure. Thank you. Thank you. And this is a perfect example. A, a fellow person from UBC, not both of us sort of passing in the wind and not realizing that we have the same passion as do the rest of the team here. And so it, it's, it's hopefully, again, how we kind of think of it sometimes is an umbrella under which anything to do with Indigenous health can be housed in terms of that partnership so that people can come in and out, whether they have a research concern, a research question, an opportunity, a curriculum, um, uh, suggestion, um, funding for scholarships for students, whatever it happens to be, we're hoping to be that focal point. And so what I would suggest is, if this is the first time you've heard of the Center for Excellence, please go to the website. Please feel free to send in uh, any comments. If you're from an organization or you know of an organization that this in any way could touch, if, could you please feel free to forward on their name and then what we'd make sure to do is we've tried to reach out to to in individual organizations but it's if we could just make sure that we feel that they know that we're out here trying to do this so that that type of feedback never gets lost in the shuffle or in the end of a session so thank you very much before we wrap up what i'd like to do is there are some people that have been working incredibly incredibly hard on this project so if you guys could just stand up so Leah Walker, and who's been really leading up the education. James Andrew, who's heading up the Aboriginal admissions. Jen Mackey, who does everything. <laughs> um, and uh, like I said, Wayne, Wayne Christian was here before. Marty Schechter, Dr. Marty Schechter, the founding director of the School of Population and Public Health where this is also ultimately going to be housed. It was here before as Marty. I think Marty had to leave. Um, and again, not all of our crew is here, but um, I was up here talking, but in no way, shape, or form the only person. This is a huge project, um, and we're excited uh, as we move forward for the Senate proposal. Thank you so much for your, for your participation, and we're going to be hanging around up here and outside. Please feel free to come up and talk to us. Yeah, and the handouts are going to be, Jen, the handouts are going to be at the back? Oh, they're already handed out. Perfect. 
Awesome. Thank you, everyone.